Welcome, everybody. It is fantastic to have the first live stream on Gallery of Guitar of 2024. And I am extremely excited to be joined by two very good friends of mine who I'm having on the Curator Series at Gallery of Guitar. Welcome to Matthew Cochran. Hey, everybody. And welcome to Stephen Mattingly. Hey, everyone. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for joining uh, me in Glasgow here from Michigan and uh, Kentucky, respectively. Um, and just a little bit about the Creator Series, because it's a while since I've actually had it on Gallery of Guitar. Um, this is the 17th episode of the Creator Series, and it has featured a whole host of guitarists over the, and not just guitarists, actually, it's gone outside of the guitar realm. And it's had um, such players as Tom Avila Toe and Bradford Werner, who runs This Is Classical guitar, Urosh Baric, the great Slovenian guitarist and recording engineer, Stephanie Jones, the fantastic Australian virtuoso, just a whole host of great uh, performers and composers like Mr. Cochran, um, all getting the chance to curate something. So come up with a piece or a performance um, that they want to share and they want to sort of, you know, maybe make their mark with. Um, and then it goes out on Gallery of Guitar, as hopefully most of you have just seen and come directly to the chat after. Um, Matthew today created for us one of his own pieces, Two Young Fish, uh, which I'm very honoured to have on the Gallery of Guitar and have premiered on the gallery um, the, this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you're watching. So that's what the Creator Series is all about. It's all about allowing a composer, a guitarist, to really think about the piece of music that they would like to share. And then we have a discussion. Um, and it actually really kicked off back in the pandemic when we were all a bit stuck and we couldn't get together as much. Um, but it's a thing that's kept going since then. And it's really wonderful to have these performances and these curations on the gallery. So without further ado, I hope you've all enjoyed the piece and come straight from watching the premiere. If you haven't, there'll be a link in the description to this video and we'll be sharing it over the coming days. But to better educate us about Two Young Fish and your piece, I'd like to welcome Matt to explain a little bit about Two Young Fish, how you came writing it um, mm -hmm. and the influences behind it. Right. Well, it seems like kind of the perfect piece to have on the Curator Series because the, the two people who were present in the room when the idea uh, uh, sort of happened uh, are on this live stream right now. Uh, uh, Matthew and I were actually watching Stephen perform uh, a concert uh, at uh, Interlochen Center for the Arts last June in, in 2023. Uh, he was giving a, a solo recital, and um, and 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 Stephen, you're going to have to forgive me because I recall you mentioning David Foster Wallace in the concert, mm -hmm. and cannot recall the piece that you were introducing in reference to <laughs> what you were talking about Father was, Wallace. So it was one, is one of the most interesting aspects to the concert series at the Interlochen Guitar Intensives each June is the Q&A after each concert. Okay. And one of the things that impressed me is that the questions from the students, they're just absolutely so apt and profound to the questions that involve the pieces that are in the program. And it was about the kind of the reasons that I put that particular program together. And that's okay. where I mentioned it in response to one of the student questions. Ah, so I feel better because I was feeling yeah. a bit guilty about the fact that there was, I couldn't remember like if there was a particular piece. And so, right. And so you had brought up, uh, uh, this uh, David Foster Wallace essay in that conversation. This is this is water, which is actually a uh, uh, often a, a, a you know there's a there's a printed version of it, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I give out uh, copies of those to uh, seniors uh, at at Interlochen when they when they graduate, and I've been doing this for for years, and so um, uh, I I just I think that the I think that the essay and I think that it, it kind of perfectly distills a lot of the themes that Foster Wallace was exploring, sometimes struggling with throughout his entire uh, uh, sort of creative life. And and it, it presents it in a way that I think is really, really great for people who aren't necessarily used to that kind of postmodernist style that he's often, uh, that, you know, associated with. 
Mm. Can we just say, maybe just for people listening who are not au fait with David Foster Wallace or don't know who he is, um, an American novelist, essayist, um, sort of, I don't know, uh, incredibly tragic human being in many ways, but like fascinatingly gifted and really talented uh, writer, um, speaking to a lot of kind of the human condition and really trying to get the human connection into his writing. Um, so, I mean, because I'm, I'm just thinking we're, we're off talking about David Foster Wallace and I wonder if people are like, who is this David Foster Wallace? <laughs> you know, I, hope people, I hope people ask that question. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah. that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really great question to ask. I think I mean, probably- you, must, you must really, to, to 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 gift his writing to the students at the end of their of their of their time at interlock and you you must have he must have had quite a profound effect on you no question uh i came across his writings toward the end of his life um uh and it was during the time that he would have been working on his his final novel, but he he probably his most famous work, I believe, is a is a kind of giant uh, <laughs> opus called this uh, uh, called uh, Infinite Jest, mm -hmm. um, and the amount of themes uh, that are are covered in, in uh, Infinite Jest and the way they're covered and just sort of his deftness as a writer and 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 just just how kind of every single cylinder you can have is firing in that guy's mind and it's just completely on display uh in that novel and that was yeah. kind of i think that was the first thing that i'd read or maybe an essay that he wrote uh called a supposedly fun thing i'll never do again um which is a <laughs> which is great it's a it's again it's another i think really excellent kind of introduction to foster wallace's uh perspectives he's uh, uh he's asked to go on a cruise like a carnival cruise ship i think or something like that i've forgotten what it was and he's probably the last person that should ever be on a cruise <laughs> and he writes about it really quite quite beautifully uh, but, uh, and, and, and actually, uh, Stephen and I, uh, uh, share this influence, but I don't believe that we knew it. Um, uh, Stephen, I don't think that we'd really discussed Fo Foster Wallace before this concert. Well, no, no, but I, I knew it in, in that I knew that you were a fan of David Foster Wallace and like several other things in life, your interest in it kind of turned me on to it and i was like eh, maybe that's something i should read because matt's a pretty smart guy and uh turns out i was a fan of it and i just couldn't get enough and i just kept reading and reading and reading and i i had been um introduced to his commencement speech to young fish years before i ever started reading his works um and so it just it, it has always been something with me and, and likewise i always share it with my students and just anyone who will listen Mm. And a quick point of, of clarification there, actually, the, the commencement speech is called This is Water. This is, yes, right. Uh, right. And, and Two Young Fish is, is, right. a, is a bit that, uh, that I took from it. Right. Um, and then... Uh, That's like the opening yeah. line, isn't it? Yeah, Two Young Fish. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. It's funny you mentioned postmodernism as well, because... Um, and I mean, we will get to the piece, and I don't want to jump ahead too far, but like... When the opening um, motif of the piece, and I'm sure we'll get into this quite a lot, has a slight postmodernistic sort of idea in the in the writing, which I think is really interesting because, you know, how you were talking about um, you were talking about David Foster Wallace writing about a cruise ship, and like when you when you see him, right, you couldn't help but think this guy's never been on a cruise ship, you know. Um, you know, he used to write um, he used to write for the U.S. Open tennis because he played tennis when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And he used to write like a column for their magazine and stuff like that. And he used to, I mean, he was quite a, I think he was quite an adept writer at other things, but he wanted to sort of keep it a little bit like away from, you know, the, not the, not the sort of, I don't know, pained writer, but like, you know, he had a persona that he was definitely, you know, putting out there, you know, as a, as a writer. And it's funny, but he was able to do these other things. And when your piece starts, I mean, it is your piece. And as the harm develops, I'm like, it's a Matthew Cochran piece, but at the beginning, I was like, oh, my God, that's like a Brewer theme. Like, you know, it had this Brewer-esque sort of figure to it. And I was like, oh, that's quite cool, because I always associate Broad Brewer as writing in a sort of neo-style. Like, he'll write neo-baroque music, or he'll write neo-classical music, or he'll take a theme, and he will then work 
it out. You know, he'll reimagine something. So he's taking material and sometimes like he plays about the structure, but he gets romantic in the end, you know, about about the thing. So like when I heard the piece, I was like, that's really nice because it, it, it sounds like something that could be David Foster Wallace-esque, if that makes sense. You know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I, I, I struggled a bit with that because I heard it in my head. It was it was so clear. It was okay. so clear that and it, this never happens. But it was like the 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 night. I mean, you and I were sitting together, Matthew, watching Steve mm -hmm. play mm -hmm. this this uh, this this concert, and I could hear the the melody. Yeah. Um. And then I I I came home. Uh. It wasn't that night, but it was. I, I believe that I, I believe it was the next night. Um. And 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 sat down and 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 played it. And I thought, oh, that sounds a lot like Brower. Hmm. Do I want to? Do I want to do this? And then the thing that normally happens, you know, happened, which is just like you, you write it, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's you know, it, it felt, it felt good. And if it feels good and if it stays there, you know, I, I kind of don't overthink it. <laughs> it only sounds like Brower to someone who's had Brower. <laughs> you know? Well, I don't know. Really? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I agree that, it, that, that, that it's definitely, it's got that kind of, um, well, it's idiomatic, is what it yeah. is, right? Yeah. Which is Brower, yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't mean that to be, to be a, a thing as for us to get hung up on at all. Like you know, I just, I just suddenly thought that was the postmodern, post postmodern. Can you do that? That sure, yeah, you can, you know, like the the thing about it that it's quite interesting. It's quite cool, you know. Yeah. Um, and it grabs you immediately if you're a guitarist because of the idiomatic nature. You're like, oh yeah, I can see how that works. That's cool, you know. Yep. Okay, sorry. So I digressed there. I jumped in. So continue on telling us about the piece. So obviously it was Steve, his concert, and then that's the germ is going around in your head. Oh that's yeah, it. totally, totally. From from there, uh, uh, I I I think the next day Steve and I happened to 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 be taking a walk, and I and I uh, pitched the idea of the piece to him. Um, and as is typical with with uh, Stephen, there's like there'll be a there'll be some idea that I sort of give to him and we'll kind of go back and forth a few times, like a little bit of well, like a little game of tennis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and by the time I think we were done with that walk, I knew what the piece was going to be from the, from the very beginning of it uh, uh, to the very end of it. And it just took uh, a little bit once, once, uh, Matthew and Stephen left uh, uh, Northern Michigan, I sat down and, and, and wrote it. And it was one of those, kind of magical experiences where the 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 piece was already there like it was all formed it was just a matter of kind of getting one idea connected to the other um and uh wow what a what a joy that was because that does not always happen <laughs> nice and, and and similarly when i got the piece the 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 piece it it, it is idiomatic However, that aside, the, the piece itself musically came to me very quickly. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I knew it because I knew you're writing so well and you wrote it in a way that was just so aligned with my playing, the strengths of my playing that I, I didn't feel I needed to hide anything or just work more assiduously than usual on a, on a piece. It just all came very naturally. And I, I think I played the piece on a concert within a month of receiving it. Yeah, wow. this all happened very, very quickly. And in fact, I, I, uh, I meant to send you a, a, a picture, Matthew. I'll have to, I'll have to post it on socials tomorrow. But it's a, it like, uh, uh, so there is not a recording that I know of of Steve, Stephen premiering the piece, um, uh, it, at University of Louisville. But it was live streamed, um, right. and so uh. hearing, hearing you do that, Stephen, I don't know. How you were feeling but my heart was about to just <laughs> come right out of my chest i mean it was it's <laughs> it's a it's a really surprising um uh experience to watch uh someone else premiere a mm. piece it's pretty it's pretty cool pretty unique <laughs> yeah it was great a great feeling to be premiering it and knowing that you could watch it so the live stream is something i have access to and i can get you that ah, okay. so. oh that's great that's very cool. It'd be cool to have that document of the very first performance because I think it's going to be very popular. I mean, I'd already noticed mm -hmm. um, the guitarist here in Scotland when I was like sort of setting everything up. 
And, you know, there's a bit of behind the scenes goes on at Gallery Guitar. I have to make sure everything's going to happen when I say it's going to happen. And I must have left some aspect of the piece visible to just some people, like maybe people that were watching playlists. I mean, people are spies, you know. <laughs> and and this, uh, this really lovely guy here in Scotland who's like, comment is like this is a great piece and i'm like Shh, you shouldn't know it's out it's not out yet but it is but like don't tell anyone but tell people you know? <laughs> it's like it's this modern world of like you want people to know but not not yet you know so like, it was uh but to have that document would be great the original live stream yeah i think i think that'd be really great and actually i i, I will say uh so my my publisher list productions Dawes has has uh, has released it so there are a few people that 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 uh, have have gotten scores so that may be a a, a a way that it's gotten under under people's uh, uh, fingers but uh, yeah the timing is always kind of a kind of a trick isn't it well, we'll definitely we'll definitely link to to productions dose. We'll stick the link in there so people can play it as well. You know for sure because I'm sure people will love to. You know the funny thing I thought, or not funny thing, but and we'll play a little bit of the piece if you don't mind, Max. I've got a little bit Please. teed up so people could hear Please, that yeah. opening theme that we've just been talking about. And I, I won't play the whole piece, just a, just a, a minute or so. And um, but when people go back and listen to the full performance, you were talking about the probably the most famous. Uh, Foster Wallace book Infinite Jest which is just this gigantic you know I think like when it was reviewed it was like the only people that reviewed that actually read it were the reviewers you know like when it first came out because there's some reviewer that said it took him five days and it was eight hours a day oh. so it was like a job to read the book he was like right okay I'm gonna have this is what I'm gonna have to do I'm gonna structure my day around this so I can get this done by a deadline you know I mean it's for anybody that's not read it it is like epic um and it has sent. This is a funny thing I remember being younger. It has sentences that are pages and pages and pages long. Now I know that's not a trick that's like new to the world of writing, but it is a magical when you read something and it's like I. It, there hasn't been. There's been punctuation and it's grammatically correct, but I have been reading a sentence for a page and a half, you know, and I've not of a not of a big type font as well. And when your piece is when your piece uh, gets to the end, <clears throat> I was a little bit surprised it ended where it ended, ah. and I was going to ask you about this. Yeah, uh, maybe after we play it, you can you can come in and just you know you, you go a bit. I was thinking like, is it unfinished? And I don't mean it's an unfinished piece, but is mm -hmm. our idea unfinished? He tragically his life ended a lot earlier than perhaps you know anyone you know would think it would have ever going to. I mean, he died in two thousand and eight, and he took his own life. It's an incredible tragedy, and it's. The piece stops, and for me, it stops. It kind of comes back to that idea that yeah. at the beginning, but it stops, and it did strike me as like a very long sentence from Infinite Jest, or just like one big long thing, you know. I mean, and I mean that's me. I could be completely wrong, and I'm quite happy to hold my hands up when I'm completely wrong. Um, but that I I was getting that when I was listening to it, you know, getting that feeling. Good, good. Okay, <laughs> so here's a clip. Beautiful stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that that main. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, that that the whole the whole piece is really a, you know around this this uh, uh, you know da di dum ba di dum da di da da di da dum da dum. That's it. 
that's the that, that that's basically what the entire uh, uh, piece is, is 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 based around. And so that in and of itself, in, uh, to my ear, is a bit unfinished. Um, I mean, it feels complete, but I believe that the complete statement should feel like there could be other things. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, yeah. Stephen, right? Is that is that is that your take on this? Yeah, the, 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 the punctuation of conclusion doesn't always need to be a period or exclamation point. It can be an ellipsis or a question mark, right? Mm. Mm. That's how I feel. And and if you listen to that that final gesture that's there, it's as if you see the fish swimming off mm. ahead in the water. And there is no right there there that's that's very apt for uh, the reference to water too there's not really a clear beginning or ending of water and i don't know i mean the, the is so maybe we should actually mention the joke um of 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 this is water right um uh, yeah. uh, which actually Stephen, i think i'm going to put you on the spot because you always tell it better than i do i i'm terrible at telling jokes and so i'm going to i'm going to hand this over to you <laughs> well I, I i know that that matthew has a bit of the commencement speech pulled up is that what you're referencing yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. maybe we should just let david foster wallace tell it Okay, then so we might not get to the punchline just in this clip because um, I actually took it from the original commencement speech, which oh, is okay. about 20 minutes in yeah. length. So I just took a clip because you can get okay. a translated version, which became the essay, I think. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, but obviously, like, we wanted to hear him say it in his own voice yeah. rather than sort of some audiobook version. So mm -hmm. this is just the beginning of it. Um, and as we've sort of already sort of, you know, explained to everybody and people might know it as well, it's it's a commencement speech, I think, from 2005 or something like that. Maybe that's right. No, it must be yeah. earlier than that. Sure. It, it's somewhere in there. He he yeah. may even mention it there. But, yeah, it's yeah in the early aughts somewhere in there. Yeah. And telling a, 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 a group of students at a liberal arts college, Mm -hmm. you know, um, the worth of their of their education, basically, right. essentially. So making that commencement speech. We call it something else here in the UK. It's not commencement. Oh, really? Like yeah, but it's the same thing, you know. Um, but there we are. So we'll play a little bit of this so people can hear the original material from which your two fish comes from. Thanks and congratulations to Kenyon's graduating class of 2005. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? <laughs> this is a standard requirement of US commencement speeches, the deployment of didactic little parable-ish stories. <laughs> the story thing turns out to be one of the better, less bullshitty conventions of the genre. But if you're worried that I plan to present myself here as the wise older fish explaining what water is to you younger fish, please don't be. I am not the wise old fish. The point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this is just a banal platitude. But the fact is that in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal platitudes can have a life-or-death importance or so I wish to suggest to you on this dry and lovely morning. Of course, the main requirement of speeches like this is that I'm supposed to talk about your liberal arts education's meaning, to try to explain why the degree you're about to receive has actual human value instead of just a material payoff. Yeah. That, that that couldn't be better said in the excerpt that you chose is, is perfect, especially there at the end, the, the, something other than the material payoff. Yeah. And really the, the, I, I would say, I would say to me, one of the themes that's the most poignant and meaningful uh, that Foster Wallace keeps coming back to is the difficulty of being present in that in every moment um and the kind of responsibility that we have to be present and to be compassionate at every moment that we're awake 
Mm -hmm. And the challenge of that is, uh, well, it's extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I think, I think it's a life's work. Um, and, uh, to me that there's, there's an extreme amount of profundity in a, in a very funny, you know, few, uh, uh, paragraphs, I think, you know, and, uh, he, he really threads that needle very beautifully. You know? That's in that profundity comes from the, the compassion that we can have for others that he's talking about the banal platitudes of a commencement speech where you would say some kind of trope type of thing to an audience of new graduates. But what he's saying to them really is that really this is a commencement to your life on this path that you've set. And it is exactly the most banal things in life that may be the most challenging where it, everyone should go listen to the 20 to 25 minute speech. Mm -hmm. But it's to say that having a little patience for one another and trying to understand one's perspective that they're coming from can help us have a more fruitful and meaningful life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice the way he sort of, I mean, he goes on, I think he's in the supermarket, isn't he? He just go, it moves on to there and like, you know, he's at the end of the day and he's yep. not done what he wants to do and he's really pissed off, basically. Yeah. And then everybody else is there being utterly pissed off as well, pretty much to exactly the same level, you know. Um, and, and he uses these kind of like um, quite straightforward um ideas all the time you know to depict these kind of things and he can lull you into a false sense of security like he did with me i sort of sort of thought well you know i kind of was i kind of get i kind of get where you're going and obviously i think as you've sort of said everybody should go and listen to the whole thing he does go where you think he's going to go but in a way that you're like ah okay it's very clever it's very good um and it's just it's making you and i think it not just as it like to what you said Stephen. it's not just making you think about the normalities are are very important actually the, the normal parts of daily existence are actually everyone's doing them and everyone's going through them but with all this different stuff of their own coming at it and mm -hmm. having the empathy and having the connection but his writing is interesting because i think it it has these crazy structural things like the long sentences i was sort of mentioning before and the textural things that are really odd like sometimes he uses quite banal examples to explain some quite profound things and sometimes that can switch people off. Can you be like, well, why is that the easy conclusion to draw? Don't don't show me that example. Show me a more sophisticated example because yeah. you might be you might be turning me off. You know, like that. I would sometimes think that a little bit personally reading his stuff. But it's the empathy that keeps coming through and the sincerity all the time, which is why I was saying like post postmodern. It's like he's he's railed against it, and everything he's read growing up has railed against it. We've tried new experimentations with with text the way he has, but he's come back to trying to spell out something of the of the humanity or the human condition of it, which is really lovely. And, he, and he, when he talks, he talks very. He's very funny. He's very dry, but he's very very funny mm -hmm. and cynical. Like you know, like yeah. and sometimes kind of like quite morose. Like you're like he's he's incredibly boring and fascinating. <laughs> you know, like you know that you're just I'm got trapped watching him sometimes. Like this is you know what a character you know yeah well you you nailed it i mean uh, yeah i i think i think those are so many of the aspects that make foster wallace such a a unique and unusual um uh, writer but also a unique and unusual personality mm, yeah, yeah yeah i think like quite meek like you know people described him as like in in when he was with people he was kind of like quite shy and retiring and quite meek and like some people would think it was an act. They would be like, we, we know you're not like this because we've read your writing and it can be quite caustic and it can be quite like, you know, it can be really direct and you can sort of, you can dismantle institutions like, you know, on, yeah. on the page. So why are you being so like sort of, um, not apologist, but like, you know, kind of, you know, just meek is maybe the word for it, you know? I agree. He's, he's, yeah. he's fascinating. Well, in, you know, Umberto Eco says similarly in the critiques about his writing that, you know, American critics will uh, point out that he has written about things other than something pedagogical or academic. And he has mm -hmm. no apologies for it because that is the standard in Europe. Yeah. And Foster Wallace, as you mentioned, was writing about sports and such, which he shared with Hunter S. Thompson yep. and in, in many other authors, in fact. And I think it's that he is coming from a, a place where he could be quite pedantic 
an academic in his writing, but he's coming down to the level of the common man without dumbing it down, so to speak. Never. He's telling a truth throughout all of it, yeah. you know, which, and the way he does can, people can be like, yeah, okay. There is no bullshit because it's yeah. like, you know, although depend, I mean, I know the package can sometimes, you know, seem a little bit something, but you know, I, I'm quite, I'm quite drawn to the, the core of it all the time. I think it's very, it's very honest speech, you know, or honest mm -hmm. writing, I guess, yeah. you know, I'm thinking about it. Uh, so we have a comment here, um, which is in the way of a question, um, which I love saying because obviously like it's the only way you can ask a question on YouTube is by making a comment, you know? So there we go. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> um, so this is from uh, our good friend, uh, Kate Botello. And I say good friend because she's a huge friend of uh, Matthew Cochran and myself. And Steve, I don't know if you met Kate when you were at Interlocking. You might have, you might not have. She's um, a, a DJ <laughs> on uh, IPR or Interlocking Public Radio. <laughs> Well, I, I, I heard her work in the sense of your visit to yeah. the video, but I didn't get the chance to meet Kate, so I hope I hope someday. Yeah, you will, I'm sure. And she's a huge uh, supporter of all things guitar and music, so hopefully at some point, you know, she'll uh, give your music a spin as well, Steve. Um, so she says, Matsy, Matsy, um, you spent a lot of time alone with this piece. Mm. Did you have any, aha, I guess that's like Eureka, moments when you first heard Stephen play it? or pick up on any nuances you hadn't heard or, or thought of before? Great question. Yeah, wow, so so many. Um, but I, 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 in in reading that question, I gotta say, the, the, like both of you have done this uh, to me. <laughs> Um, on, on, on many occasions, it frustrated it's, you beyond all hope and repair, and the yeah. exact opposite. It's uh, I, I've I've had a, a I've had so many moments with with both of you where there's something that I've, I've written or arranged, and I brought it to you, and you've each presented it like in a way that makes it so obvious. Like, oh, this is the way this line goes, or this is how this passage should be played. This is the articulation. Mm. Um, but it wasn't in any way how I imagined it. Mm. Um, and uh, I've I've had that experience, in fact, with with both of you uh, within the past couple of months. So, you know, Stephen, when uh, Kate, to answer this question specifically, um, uh, there's a section in the piece that that repeats it's uh i i think you might maybe call it the 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 sort of meatiest section of the piece where the open strings are uh sort of very the, there's a lot of range stuff happening and that main melody is very very high in the range and then the open strings are kind of creating this little ostinato underneath and steven kind of brought out the melody in a way that made the ostinato actually kind of sound sort of undulating and sound like water in a way that I hadn't really considered. Um, I don't know if that was in any way intentional, but I realized as he was playing it during the premiere, oh, that's the section where the fish are in the water. Like the fish are looking around and they're actually in the um, they're, 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 they're seeing it. That, at least that was, that, that's, that's what I thought. And I don't know because we, uh, Stephen and I had gone over it. So this will be the question for you, Stephen. Um, uh, you and I had gone over it on a zoom call, uh, maybe a week before, uh, the premiere. And I think you were playing it a little bit differently than the way you ended up playing it at, at the premiere. Yeah, that I, I absolutely. I, I don't I don't know from section to section specifically, but the interesting thing there that you mentioned that because this is the first I'm aware that that's the effect it had on you. Yes, I very specifically thought of that little like ostinato undulating uh, neighbor tone and 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 unison section that that was water, but what I heard above that was a lyric a, a lyric that wasn't present right and unsung lyric of you singing that melodic line 
Mm. You know, oh. I was I was phrasing it the way I think Matt might sing it. <laughs> that's nice. Maybe you were. Yeah, I mean, that's what I tried for. In 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 the attempt to do it, I thought was the the main thing I wanted to go for because then I had something in mind as a goal of some way to shape it. But I, from our collaborations in the past, where you have sung to our guitar duo accompaniment, that's that's what was in my ear. And from your own pieces for for yourself. See, this is the this is why I like collaborating, though. Mm -hmm. You know, th this is the like these surprises. Mm -hmm. And Matthew, we had I don't know how many times we had this in the recording that we just uh, came out of. Mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly with with, um, uh, with with the big duo piece um, that's that's mm -hmm. going to go on on the record, um, Pale Blue Dot, uh, because we've never performed that piece live, and yeah. there were multiple places uh, where y you had just kind of changed the phrase from what I was expecting. It was exactly what was on the page, but the way yeah. you interpret it. <laughs> the way you interpreted it and, and 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 both both Stephen and Matthew you, you've you've both done this and and I can't tell you how that it's like when that surprise happens it it takes me into the piece in ways I just never realized that was there I never realized what was you know like what was actually in the uh, in the phrase or what was in the section. It's pretty, pretty wild. Well, you do sing all the time in rehearsals. You know that you just, you don't, you don't stop singing. You're always singing, you know? I, so I, I see know. It, I yeah, just probably sitting there with music and he's stand and he's like, right, look, I'm just going to give it, I'm going to belt it out. Right. I'm going to be listening. I'm going to close the door and I'm just going to sing it. And that'll probably be the way he wants it. Right. I mean, that, you know, like, like <laughs> I mean, you do sing though. And it's, 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 it's so clear then what you want. And that's the thing because you are a singer. Mm -hmm. you sing when you're teaching, you sing when we're rehearsing and, you know, I, I, I bring earplugs to every rehearsal for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but joking aside, and I know that's yeah. hard. Um, and, and I love you all dearly, but yeah, if you sing it, we will immediately get it because we don't need the page then. Yeah. We really don't need the page because you've got all the information that actually the page can't provide because our notation system is pretty basic, to be honest. Yeah. And as soon as you sing, we get inflection. We get what you really mean with the, the arrival of notes and, the, and and how the tension is between the intervals and that theme. Da, da, dee, da, da, da. Where, you know, it's got big intervals, actually. Yeah. And it's got tension in them, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you, could play, you play on a keyboard... Actually, they're really quite gestural as well on the guitar. Like it's a, it's a thing we can watch when you play. It's really interesting to see. Um, it's an amazing question from Kate there, actually. And it's it's just it's just um, it unpicks so many things. Of um, one thing that I it took a long time, and this is quite David Foster Wallace in, if that's a thing. Um, didn't he come up with Lynchian? Um, so Wallace in. Um, that took me a long time to get this is that I would still wonder if it was right when I played it because I couldn't hear it from the score. <laughs> so I had all this information on the score and I could play it, but there was still a want in me to, for someone to be able to be like, yes, that is how it's supposed to sound. So even, even sometimes like playing things that you've written, Matt and stuff like that, I'll, I'll, I'm kind of looking like, is that, I mean, I know it's what's written, but it's the way I'm playing it what actually it's supposed to sound like. It's like for me, there's still a there's still a moment of real insecurity. You could I could have the metronome on, I could be playing every rhythm right, I could be playing every note right, good sound, whatever it is. I'm still not sure that what you've brought into existence from the page is actually what what the person wants. So I think that process is amazing when the composer hears it and maybe it's not exactly what they wrote, but it is what they heard themselves. And the performer and the composer have got to that place through maybe that intimate knowledge of the person, you know, knowing how they write, getting a deeper understanding. That's why, you, you know, you're mentioning collaboration is one of your favorite things. I mean, it's, it fills in all the gaps. You yeah. Know? Yeah, it does. But I, but I, I don't think, especially with, I mean, one thing about, 
collaboration is that, uh, you know, I feel very, very, very fortunate that the people that I'm collaborating with are musicians of an exceedingly high caliber. And so you can trust the people who are performing that music to bring in maybe a, a almost a different sort of authority. Um, and, you know, I, I, I know that feeling of kind of um, asking for permission and I had this really, really cool experience with um, the the composer Jacob TV. Um, I'd I'd recorded uh, uh, one of one of his pieces called "The Body of Your Dreams," and uh, and he and I were uh, uh, communicating quite a bit uh, dur during that during that process. And I'd sent him a scratch recording uh, of of uh, a good chunk of the piece, maybe like five minutes of the piece. And his response. I, I think about it almost every day. Uh, it, it was, it, it, it's going to sound kind of caustic, but it wasn't, I don't think he meant it uh, in, in, in that way, but he said, I am not surprised by any note that you've played. Uh, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm not like I, what I want from you is to, to surprise me. I know how this piece goes. Don't yeah. play just the notes, surprise yeah. me. Hmm. Um, and uh, uh, th that was such a profound lesson to me, and I, I have to admit that I've I've taken that and and I think about it all the time. And when I get surprised um, by other people playing uh, uh, stuff that I've that I've that I've written, and it could be really simple. It can be really just like, oh, the slur sounds amazing. Wow, I didn't I wouldn't have thought about that. Or mm -hmm. it can be uh, exceedingly complex. You know, like a, a a rethinking of a way a phrase is is on the page. And and uh, luckily, neither one of you are, are ever uh, shy uh, about bringing uh, original ideas and uh, on, onto stuff that's just on a page. Because I don't think you you, tr you you either one of you have like a um, a, a fear of. Uh, oh, okay, this is on the page, so I can't be incorrect. You know what I mean? Like one of the things I really like about working with both of you is that you are confident in uh, in in the way that you interpret what's on the page, and you have so much personality uh, uh, to bring into the uh, into the interpretations. That's personally what I'm looking for all the time. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting to me you mentioned fear because that was exactly what I was thinking. Is I have no fear of disappointing you. Either of you, I can <laughs> disappoint you again and again, and yeah. really, no right. surprise. It's, there's no surprise there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but if you really fulfill us one day, then we'll be completely. You know, no, we won't know what to do. You know? Yeah, yeah. That would be, all bets are off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we have to mention a couple of things. You know, you recorded it in uh, your second home. Yeah. Uh, the, the the historic barns uh, park, the lovely barn in in Michigan. Um, it was looking very well, and I, I, you recorded it. When did you actually make the video? Christmas Eve. Oh wow! Nice. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was quite a day. I I, I really. Um, it just. It, it was sort of a, a trick of the calendar, uh, and uh, my wife and I ended up with 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 a little bit of extra time and. Um, so I was able to just reach out to the, uh, good folks at the barn and say, Hey, is there, uh, any availability? And I said, yeah, just jump in. And, and, uh, it was just a little snowy, uh, unlike what it is right now, which is well over a foot of snow that we've gotten in the past couple of hours. And, uh, it, yeah, it was, a, it, it was pretty magical. I gotta say, it, yeah, that was that was pretty great, and I, and I'm glad I I wasn't recording it directly after I'd heard Steve perform it, um, uh, because that that kind of rocked me, you know what I mean? Like I, I needed a I needed a few weeks to kind of, uh, well, first of all, I, I I didn't I hadn't actually learned the piece when uh, when Stephen gave his uh, a premiere, um, but then I had to kind of come back and rethink about. Uh, a few of the items that uh, that Stephen had come up with uh, in in his performance, and so I was happy actually to be able to. It was it's it's weird because I ended up, you know, you write the piece, you send it off, then you hear it pre performed, and you're like, oh, there's some authority there. I guess I better learn how to play the piece the way the guy that premiered it played the piece. <laughs> uh, and, and that's something that I'll, I'll I'll probably wrestle with a bit hearing you play it and not changing 
some aspect, well, obviously you'll influence me as you always do, but not changing some of the aspects that I'll take to my recording of the piece. Yes, because uh, yeah, we should we should mention that actually Stephen's going to come up to the barn, uh, oh, yeah. uh, Matthew, right after we we're going on a tour. Uh, uh, we're going to play uh, in uh, Comstock Hall and uh, where where Stephen uh, uh, premiered the piece. Um, then we're going to go back, and then Stephen and I are going to record uh, uh, Two Young Fish and a whole bunch of other uh, solo pieces. Uh, for his uh, for his full length record, so that yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be quite the quite the feedback loop. I think we're gonna have to just kind of not listen to each other uh, uh, for a little while. But it'd be nice. It'd be nice to have actually. I think sometimes two reference recordings, like where you're oh, yeah. sort of the person that did the premiere and it was written for, and then soon after the composer and back and forward. I mean, that mm -hmm. doesn't always happen. Like you know the the. Um, and especially now in the digital age, and the, you know, you can even see the live stream that you, you know that that, that uh, Steve mentioned. He can find for you. I mean, it's like I think that's it. It feels daunting, maybe, but it's actually great material and data for like coming to. I mean, probably somewhere between the two of you is like the perfect. The composer relinquishes the control a little bit, and then the performer hears what the composer really wants, and then clarifies some of their own interpretive ideas, and then in the middle of that those two, not extremes, but those two ways, there comes a sort of, a, a, maybe a, a version that people then follow. Like, you, you never know. I mean, it's like sometimes when I hear uh, Barrios and stuff like that, you know how we can hear his old recordings now on yeah. YouTube, his old cylinder recordings, and you kind of go, whoa, I've been playing Barrios completely differently for 20 years, you know, and so is everybody else. Mm -hmm. And then you hear these recordings and you think, oh, and it happens with Penis as well. And mm -hmm. we can hear Ravel playing the piano, we can hear Rachmaninoff, you know, it's like, it's really interesting to for for scholars and for students to have those reference recordings to work for. So, you know, I wouldn't be in too much. Uh, I wouldn't hold back too much either of you. I'd go for it. <laughs> yeah, I just I don't think I just don't think there's a correct uh, uh, interpretation. Yeah. I you know, and I and I and I, I mean, you you both have recorded a lot throughout your careers, and you know what a snapshot. A performance is and you and, and a recording is i mean i've got stuff that I, I i wrote and recorded two years ago that i would re-record today and completely change yeah uh, you know the, the the way i would i would do it and in some cases because of one or both of you <laughs> you know and um i i think that's fine i think that's great you know i i i can't imagine there being a definitive um, mm -hmm. uh, recording of a piece other than the sort of, uh, I don't know, like, like, uh, bookends of, you know, being alive and then not being alive, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? like, Oh, this, this is a recording this person made, you know, yeah. early in their life. And uh, you know what I mean? Uh, well, like, but other than that, I, I, I just don't Goldberg. think there is one, you know, uh, you know, I was thinking of Gould with the Goldberg, you know, in the yeah. early twenties and mm -hmm. then, as an old man, and also some of the th reactions he had to his own recordings where he would write extended essays with bar numbers about mm -hmm. why he would never do what he did on that recording ever again. So if you bought that recording 10 years after it was released, you also should get the appendix, you know, that comes with it just to sort of clarify the choices he made then, the reasons for them, and why he would never do them again. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, it, it depends on how hung up you are, I guess, you know, and yeah, he, he was at the forefront to some extent of the level that we could go to with editing and recording. I mean, he would have the same bits just, you know, duplicated in tape because he was like, well, that works. So let's keep, that's fine. We have so much room to experiment and try things, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and it's fascinating. I mean, like there could be something in that gentlemen, like, you know, documenting Steve going to the same space as you recorded it on Christmas Eve. And then the two of your recordings sort of, like side by side just to see the differences and the nuances mm -hmm. and the way you're approaching different phrases mm -hmm. approaching the, the 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 acoustic you know i mean I, th I think that would be absolutely fascinating like you know i mean to guitar nerds and i'm a guitar nerd <laughs> you're you're in good company another challenge another challenge for the recording you know yeah. no i think i think that's great i i, I mean i <laughs> To me, it seems like a, a bit of a game, you know, or a, maybe like a, a conversation that we that we will end up having. 
Yeah. I hadn't actually thought about any of these things until this very conversation. So I don't know, Stephen, are you getting are you getting um, uh, a little verklempt? No. Well, I mean, it, it's it's an emotional thing to play your piece. And that's the going back to the premiere that, you know, sharing your message with the world through the lens of my interpretation was something that was significant, a significant moment for me to share, it, especially the message that's behind it of David Foster Wallace and this is water. But I think that going back to that message, that that's a commencement speech and address to students. The beauty of this is that I I don't know that that you'll agree, but in in my opinion, what a great message to share with students that there is a reason why we make this art and why we continue to craft and perform things that in some cases have been written centuries ago. And there are many interpretations, some of them considered the conclusive interpretation or the official interpretation, mm -hmm. but yet there's still room for invention and creativity. and the contrasts that we'll inevitably have in our performances will highlight that for them to say that there's no reason to play in some kind of request for permission of yeah. a composer, whether living or past, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just yeah. share our voice through what we believe to connect to that, that performer in that audience and that composer. Well, and, and I would say th there was a, a conversation that you and I were having across a great distance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 that evening it was completely without any words whatsoever. Mm -hmm. of course, you had to be on the hot seat. You were actually, you know, playing the notes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but, but it was, you know, a, a, every, every phrase that you performed felt to me like some kind of, uh, like a coded message. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, that, that, that night I had a, you know, not packed hall, but at least, you know, 350 or 400 people in the audience. And I wasn't only playing to them. I was very intentionally playing to you uh -huh. as I was sitting there on the artist bench and you were at home in your lazy boy with a snuggie. You know, I, <laughs> that's incredibly <laughs> accurate to what was happening. I know. I knew <laughs> that was the case. Yeah. <laughs> like, go to your happy place. <laughs> uh, that's magical ah it's great well i don't know if there's anything um else of 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 great pertinence for our audience uh, matt in terms of when they're listening to your piece anything else that you want to mention for them to look out for i mean part of the creative series is that it gives people a bit more insight into the way people are interpreting you know their favorite pieces or what they want to say with a new work like yours so i mean if there's anything else that you wanted to mention now is of course the time well i think if if there's any takeaway from this conversation that uh that well at least that i will will, will take away is the the importance of not giving the composer all of the authority i think you um I think you you cheat yourself as an interpreter out of a lot of artistic uh, inspiration. And I think you also uh, maybe miss opportunities to please uh, people who are who are listening to it and 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 you know in this very case it happens to be the guy that wrote it i mean it's it's what a delight for things to uh be just ever so different you know what i mean just take it do your thing make make music make art out of it it's 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 supposed to be yours you know once you've once you've decided to where where those notes go and and how they go and how you're going to uh, uh, play them, uh, I I really think it it belongs to uh, the performer in that in that very moment, and it can be a really special conversation between the uh, the, the the performer and whoever else is in the room. Mm. Well said, sir. Well said. Well, for everybody uh, watching, go back and check it out again um, Two Young Fish by Matthew Cochran um, after This Is Water and based on that essay by David Foster Wallace. It was premiered first by 
Stephen Mattingly, who has joined us tonight. Thank you very much, Steve, for being with us this evening. Thanks for having me, Steve. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thank you, Matt, for writing such a beautiful piece and for creating it for the Gallery of Guitar. It will uh, continue to be a very important part of the huge library of reference recordings, hopefully, that are now up there on the gallery and interviews and chats. Um, just for the general audience on the gallery and also the audience looking for the next episode of Duo Talk, the first episode of 2024 happens later this month on the 28th of January when we will have um, the Escocia duo violin and guitar, Roberto Kuhn versus and Katrina Lee on violin. They will join us live with their producer, um, Uros Baric. Uh, the record came out, the new album on uh, Baros Records just um, a few weeks ago, I believe. So we are getting them right off hot off the press um, to talk about this great collection of South American repertoire that they put together in brand new arrangements for violin and guitar. It's an absolutely gorgeous album. We'll have them both on the show and we'll have Uros dropping in and we'll talk a lot about the recording process, the arrangement process, and we'll hear um, and see them performing on the show. So that's on the 28th of January. Um, and yeah, everybody, the link for getting the music, getting the notes for um, Two Young Fish will also be in the description. So if any of you out there are inspired by Matt's performance and hearing Steve and Matt talk about it, you can get your hands on the notes and you can try it for yourselves as well. So I have a quote from David Foster Wallace, which I think might have been the correct. You know, it's like when you pick something up before it happens and you write something down and then you put it away. Hmm. And then the event happens and then you pick it up and you go, aha, we were right all along. So I chose a quote by David Foster Wallace in the in the hope that our conversation would probably get to this point at some point. Um, so to finish, this is a quote that I think um, speaks to the compositional part of the chat we've had tonight about letting go and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's also whimsical and kind of funny and kind of dry in his usual style. So... Everybody is identical in their secret unspoken belief that way deep down they are different from everyone else. <laughs> okay, so there we leave it there. Um, thank you all for watching and listening, and um, we will see you all in the gallery very soon. Thanks, Matt, and thanks, Steve, so much. Thank, thank you. you. See you soon. <laughs>